everybody, Sarah here. Uh, so this week I'm going to be doing a Q&A where I went and gathered a bunch of questions that you guys have asked me on these videos and I'm going to answer them in a video. I have answered all, if not most, of these questions in the comment section already, but uh, if one person is asking a question, it might be something that someone else might wonder uh, and they just haven't taken the chance uh, to ask the question yet. So I thought I would answer it for all of you. Uh, like, subscribe, share if you think someone will be interested in this video and uh, you know all that stuff I'm not feeling super great this week so I'm really happy that this is gonna be a little bit more of a laid-back video for me uh, it's not COVID but it's uh, annoying it's all up in my head so I'm <clears throat> going to try my best to get through this video just bear with me oh also check out my website I have uh, snake t-shirts uh, you can get them in any color uh, you can get them in custom tie-dye uh, they're everywhere from small to like triple XL so uh, if you're interested in getting t-shirts I would love if you would buy t-shirts. I actually just had a custom tie-dye t-shirt go out the other day and uh, that was really awesome and really fun. Um, I also have other things. I have masks. There's still a pandemic whether we like it or not and so if you would like a snake mask I can also tie-dye those as well. They mostly just come in white but uh, I love tie-dyeing so if that's something you guys are interested in you can get that there. Uh, and other things I also will be putting snakes for sale and stuff up there as well. So sarahsnakeshop.com if you want to see any of my stuff. I'm jumping into the video now. All right, these are not in any particular order. Uh, most of them, I think, will just be in alphabetical order of the person who asked the question. So uh, the first one is, can I breed palmetto and scaleless? What will I get? Uh, and yes, you can breed palmetto to a scaleless. And the answer is you will get 100% het palmetto and scaleless, assuming there's nothing else going on. Uh, so they should all look like your typical het palmetto, which uh, kind of looks a little bit like a hypotype, like or very light colored normal almost. And um, you'll just, they'll just be het for both. Now, when you breed uh, het palmetto scaleless back together with each other, um, you'll get a mix of your uh, het palmetto looking hypo-ish normal looking snakes. Uh, you'll also get some scaleless, uh, some palmetto, palmettos and then some palmetto scaleless as well if you mix all this together. The next question is uh, how can I produce the closest to a black corn snake? Uh, and that's something that's kind of been up for debate because there are some mutations that get a little bit darker than others uh, and I'm assuming with this question that they are also hoping for patternless. So they're hoping for it to, to just be a completely patternless jet black snake uh, and I would say the best way to do that is to get um, maybe charcoal, red coat, uh, and maybe some sort of vanishing stripe kind of thing going on. Uh, the thing is, um, we don't really have a way to get like black black everywhere on a corn snake yet. And so like even then it may still be more of like a dark gray instead of a black. But some people have speculated that you could add even some like cinder into the line that might darken it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, that red coat mixed with an anery type like uh, charcoal is going to get you like a darker looking snake overall because red coat mixed with anery makes it more dark black and not red. I know that that's confusing, uh, but that's where we are right now with naming different gene mutations. Red coat doesn't always make things red. I can make a new video on that. I plan to in the future anyway, so uh, keep an eye out for that maybe next month. So the next question is basically asking, um, will females also go off food in the spring like males do? This is corn snake. I don't know if it's corn snake specific, but it's at least uh, a corn snake question. This is a corn snake channel, so that's what we're focusing on is corn snakes. Uh, and the answer is pretty much no. Um, a lot of times males in the spring will either be very finicky with food, like they won't want, really want to eat food and they might maybe take a small meal, but they're really not interested in taking the normal amount of food that they normally will eat. Uh, and that's because in breeding season, the males are going to be more focused on whether there's females around. And even if you don't have females around, and even if through the winter or whatever, you didn't change temperatures or anything like that, snakes still know what time of year it is. So males will occasionally go off food in the spring or be a little more picky with food or just not eat as much. Uh, and females typically do not do this. In fact, in the springtime, females will be ovulating and often will be eating more in anticipation of potentially producing eggs. Some female snakes will produce eggs with or without a male. Um, they may or may not be fertile. They usually aren't. Uh, there is a thing called parthenogenesis where a female will clone herself and then lay eggs with only her DNA in them. Um, many times those do not turn into be viable offspring or if they hatch they are maybe usually deformed in some cases. Not all the time. Um, 
I know this is kind of like a tangent, but uh, and like I said, the answer is generally no, because the females are uh, wanting to eat more food actually in anticipation of potentially breeding and needing to lay eggs. And that could be a possible reason why males don't eat as well. Uh, in the wild, there's gonna be a little bit more food scarcity than obviously in captivity, hopefully anyway. Uh, so um, if the males eat less food, there's more food for the females to eat. And that kind of makes sense. That's just the logic in my own head though. I don't have those like exact numbers or whatever. Anybody who's done that research, you're welcome to like post something down below to let me know. But um, that's kind of my hypothesis anyway with that. The next question is what's the difference between motley and motley stripe? Uh, because there's all this confusing thing with stripe and motley and pinstripe and like what's the difference with all of these things? Uh, I did do a video on motley versus stripe that I'll link above for you guys uh, but the short answer is if you breed a stripe to a motley, it's similar to breeding, say, a diffused to a normal. Um, you're not going to get the visual diffused in the first generation. Just like if you breed a stripe to a motley, you're not going to get the visual stripe in the first generation. Motley and stripe do share sort of a place in the DNA, but motley is visually dominant. So basically what that means is when you breed them together, you will get motleys that are het for stripe. And in order to get visual stripes, you have to then breed those two uh, motleys het stripe together. Or if you breed just a stripe to a normal type, you can uh, breed those babies together and get stripes. But when you're talking about stripe and motley and breeding those together, since motley is visually dominant over stripe, breeding a stripe to a motley will get you all motleys that uh, carry the stripe mutation. So when someone says they have a stripe motley or a motley stripe, genetically at the very least, uh, some people will mislabel their pinstripes as being stripe motleys. Um, that's not technically correct, uh, but a genetic stripe motley is a visual motley that carries a stripe mutation, and usually that means there was a stripe parent or maybe a motley parent that was het for stripes, so there's like a 50% chance of that being carried on. Uh, and the best way for me to help people understand that is if people understand uh, the other more basic things. So if you understand that breeding a normal to a diffused gives you normals het diffused, but the the normal is visually dominant over the diffused. It, that's that's easy to understand for a lot of people once they kind of get the hang of corn snake genetics. Um, basic corn snake genetics. I mean, I, there's so much that goes on and I'm learning more and more. Like, genetics can be so complicated. Uh, but as far as the basics go, once you understand that sort of dominant recessive relationship between different gene mutations, uh, you can kind of also get to understand that Breeding motley to stripe is similar in that way where you're going to get visually all motleys uh, that will be het for stripe. Uh, I hope that that clears it up for people. I, like I said, I did make that video, so um, you can go check that out if you would like. The next question is, can you explain what allelic means? Uh, and yes, kind of. Uh, again, I'm not a geneticist, and um, I can only really give you the basics of my own understanding. Uh, so like take it with just enough of a grain of salt and maybe do some of your own research like uh, I've done a lot of research obviously and I've been doing this for a long time But I don't know everything and trying to keep everything in layman's terms is also a challenge in itself But essentially allelic means that they share a place uh, in the DNA kind of um, again That's layman's terms. That's not exactly how you would want to uh, You know tell other people and I'm sure that some geneticists out there are screaming at me right now There is what we call a locus when we're talking about a gene. So a gene is not a gene mutation. Uh, when we're talking about uh, like amelanistic, uh, hypomelanistic, motley, these are mutations to the basic gene that we have that controls whatever that is. So whether it's the amount of pigment or how the pigment is placed or how the pattern ends up, etc. Whatever the gene is responsible for, there's a mutation in that that causes the changes that we see. So there's a mutation in the gene that um, controls the melanin and so that is what causes a melanism, lack of melanin. There's a mutation in that gene that causes that. So when genes are, when gene mutations are allelic to each other, basically what we mean is it's a mutation that happened in the same place on the gene, in the same locus basically, uh, and when you breed the two gene mutations together, 
they interact with each other because they're right next to each other. Now you can have different mutations in the same gene that don't interact with each other this way. One good example is palmetto. We talked about palmetto in another video. I'll link that above. Um, but there's the, uh, so the, the gene that is responsible for palmetto or the, at least the mutation that's responsible for the palmetto look is also the gene that's responsible for how many cells go into the eyeballs. And when you breed palmettos, there's uh, like, because of, because of the mutation that causes palmetto, that mutation happens very closely in the gene to the place that controls how much, how many cells go into the eye. So when the gene gets mutated in the spot that causes the palmetto look, sometimes it gets mutated also in the spot that's gonna cause the eyeball uh, issues, like the big bug eye issues. Now that's different, but it kind of gives you an idea of what I mean when I say two, like a gene can be mutated in two different ways. And that's just an example of a gene being mutated like very close in, like to like multiple different things that can happen. So this is what happens. Allelic gene mutations are what happen when you have um, the same gene mutated in the same place, uh, but just in a different way. So when it comes to say amelanistic and ultra, uh, ultra being a hypotype and obviously amel being the amelanistic type. So the exact same place on the exact same gene that controls the melanin was, mu was mutated for amelanistic. And it's also been mutated for a hypomelanistic, which is what we call ultra. And since they're in the same place, when snakes breed together, they collide and they mix together, com combining, making an ultra mel. So that's essentially what allelic means. It means there's um, the same place on the same gene was mutated, but in two separate ways, in two separate mutations. So when you breathe them together, they mix. Uh, usually we call that incomplete dominant as well. Um, that's not um, a perfect word for what we're talking about. When we're talking about these recessive mutations, it works well enough. So someone asked, what does Ultramel mean? <laughs> and I also did a video on Ultra and Ultramel not that long ago, but um, just what I just meant, it's the combination of Ultra, the gene mutation, and Amel, the gene mutation, so Ultra Mel. We've done this a few different times in corn snakes, like Hypo Berry, where we have Hypo and Strawberry, mix that together, it's Hypo Berry. Sometimes uh, it's easier just to take parts of the two words that um, you know are in the gene mutations we're talking about and just mix them together when we're talking about the combination. So this person asked, uh, so typically do you cut eggs if they uh, don't hatch on their own? Uh, the answer is sometimes, it kind of depends. Um, a lot of like python breeders cut their eggs um, a few days before they're due to hatch or whatever. And a lot of this is just to prevent drowning, but some of it, honestly, let's be honest, they're just impatient and they want to see what's in those eggs. There are positive and negative aspects to cutting eggs. Um, if we're dealing with something that's really rare, like the golden mutation, uh, we would probably have a lot more goldens if the people who had these snakes before had made sure to cut eggs so that babies could get out and not drown. Uh, but on the other hand, those goldens may have some sort of issue with them where their eggs are also going to have the same problem or their offspring are going to have the same problem of not getting out of the eggs. Um, I, I use this as an example because they're uh, there was a time back in 2015 when Joe Pierce was working with the Goldens and uh, actually produced some visual Goldens, but they could not make it out of the egg. Uh, and he waited basically until the eggs had died to cut the eggs open to see what was inside. And it was the only Goldens that would have been produced in that clutch. Uh, and we would have like a half a dozen more Goldens in the world right now if he had cut those eggs sooner. But it was sort of more in his uh, you know, moral obligation to uh, not cut the eggs. And if something dies, it dies, kind of more of a natural selection type of thing. So um, just, it kind of goes back and forth. Uh, it depends on the project. It depends on um, how important it is that everything makes it out of the egg. I know some breeders that like, once the eggs hit about 62, 63 days, they just cut all the eggs. They just do, they just go ahead and cut them all. The reason for that is of course, to get as many live babies as possible. And then, like I said, there are some who refuse to cut any eggs uh, because they don't want any like weak gene mutations to get into the hobby or whatever. 
So for me personally, um, once the first two or three cut the eggs, I may go ahead and make little cuts in the rest of the eggs. Um, and again, it also kind of depends, like sometimes I am not able to be as attentive to all of the eggs and all of the things every single week. So some weeks, like for example, if I'm traveling or whatever, I'm obviously not gonna be able to be there to make sure that I'm able to cut every egg open. Uh, but usually with corn snakes, you just don't have to worry about it that much. I have had some snakes die in the egg before. Uh, it has been a tragedy. I think it was back in 2019 or maybe 2020. 2020 sounds more familiar. Um, where I lost a couple of gold dusts in the egg because I did not cut the eggs. But again, do we want to keep snakes that, you know, might be genetically weaker and continue those in the hobby? Like, it's it's a whole, like, moral morality uh, argument, and we could have that discussion at some point, but the answer is it depends, and I don't have a straight answer for you. Um, I guess in my, my, the straightest answer I can give you is, um, not unless it seems necessary for some reason. That's it. That's the only answer I have. Hey everybody, Future Sarah here in editing. Um, I ended up recording almost an hour's worth of content for this video. And uh, as I got to editing it, I realized it was just going to be way too long. So I'm going to cut it up into three separate videos. Um, I one will go up, obviously, the one you're seeing now, and then um, I'll, I'll put other pieces of it up um, sort of as there's gaps uh, in time where we're waiting on eggs to hatch or whatever, so um, you will get the rest of this video at some other point in time. Uh, I do want to go ahead and thank my members, uh, so thank you Jelly Dots, Melissa, Raul, Alterna, Amy, Bridget, William, Robert, other Amy, and April. You guys are amazing. I really appreciate you guys being a part of this channel. If anybody else would like to be a member, you can click join under any video uh, it's two dollars a month and it gets you you know exclusive content I know I've said exclusive content in every single video since then but uh, you'll get access to lives after they're over you will get uh, bits and pieces of little videos that I upload here and there I've been uploading uh, to the members pretty much every week um, just like little things that didn't quite fit in the rest of the channel so you'll get that kind of stuff and uh, I also just appreciate you and you'll just be supporting me so I thank you so much for everyone who has been willing to donate your money it, it means so much to me you have no idea uh, I'm still feeling a little under the weather too so that's just another reason that I kind of wanted to get done with this um, it's it's kind of running late on time for me to upload this video uh, it's kind of in a time crunch so I'm gonna kind of just end it here and give you guys the rest of it another time um, also there's <laughs> apparently now somebody's copywriting the uh, classical music that I've been using which I didn't think that that was a thing I didn't think that you could copyright classical music so I also had to take down the original upload I had for this video and change the music in it and so it's just been a whole hullabaloo and all the more reason to just sort of give you guys uh, a reasonably sized video this time and you'll get the rest another time. Uh, thank you for watching. If I did miss your question, it's probably by, it's probably in the other parts of the video. But if you do have other questions, follow-up questions to what you heard here, etc., feel free to leave those down below and I may add those to a future video as well. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.